Hi everyone, this is Nigel Merrick, founder of the Xenolog Photography Business and Marketing website and a very warm welcome to our latest Inner Circle Featured Photographer webinar. Now the Inner Circle is a, a place where you can learn from other successful working photographers and become part of a growing community of professional photographers just like you who want to run successful businesses of their own. Members have full access to all the recordings of these webinars and interviews, bonus training programs and our private support community on Facebook. To find out how to join us, head over to www.zenalog.com slash blog slash inner circle and we'll see you on the inside. Now, today I'm very excited to be joined by boudoir photographer Robin Owen from Washington DC and we'll be talking about how she built her boudoir photography business, the marketing, sales and challenges that come with that as well as taking an in-depth look at some of her best images. We'll also be taking your questions along the way too so you can type those into the questions box and we'll do our best to answer those for you as we go. So welcome Robin, it's really great to have you here today and I'm very excited to talk about the genre of boudoir photography and uh, especially as it's sort of enjoyed something of a comeback in recent years. Hi Nigel, how are you? Thanks I'm for having me. Oh, you're very welcome, thanks for being here. So before we get started, can we give everyone a quick glance into your world, sort of how you got started and your journey in the world of, uh, as a professional photographer? Uh, it kind of started by accident. When my kids got older, I wanted to get out of the house because I was bored. So I looked around on the community college and saw a photography class and thought that would be fun. And I went down there, and one of my teachers worked for Time Life. The other one worked for National Geographic. And after a few months, they sort of pulled me aside and said, why aren't you doing this for um, as a profession and I just never thought of it before. So they kind of pushed me and I started learning Photoshop, teaching myself that and just taking classes and you know learning everything I could learn about it. And then I was on a forum and I met Neil Van Niekerk and he needed an assistant for his workshop. So I uh, ended up working for him for a year and a half and really just learned so much. He fast-tracked me into the world of professional photography and uh, after this I was no longer teaching the seminars with him I just came home and started working on my own business and it's just been a progression you learn and change and you know it never ends the learning never ends yeah I quite agree uh, you know that <laughs> so many people think that learning is done when you leave high school or college and that you know that you don't have to learn anything more after that and oh, really no. it's just the beginning you know <laughs> yeah I'm still always taking workshops I'm on creative live constantly downloading theirs <laughs> right right yeah and you learn uh, something from everybody absolutely I, I quite agree I mean I consider myself to be a lifelong student of all kinds of things everything from photography of course to business to internet marketing and uh, psychology and all kinds of uh, things that have a, a sort of a, a, an impact on the business that we are uh, so privileged and fortunate to be in. Um, well, everything's changing so fast too. Yeah. Like every yeah. time you turn around there's something else to learn. <laughs> yeah. Oh absolutely, you're very right. And, um, and and so when when you first got started then, did you start out with boudoir photography you know when you opened your own business or did you start out with something else and then gradually move move into this it was weddings is well portrait shoots and then weddings and then I just started hearing about boudoir and I came home and grabbed my nieces and I said like, come on let's do a boudoir shoot and so I did one with them and then I ran back up to New York and I was showing the pictures to Neil and he's like, these are really good. You need to do this. So my brother was like, gee, thanks a lot for shooting my kids. But other than that, it was, uh, wasn't too hard to get into. Okay. And, and so now would you describe boudoir as the, the, the one thing that you really want to focus on going forward as a, as a main specialty? Yes, it is. It's, it is the main thing I do, but I still do other work too. I find that weddings keep me sharp on my um, lighting. You know, they, you have to think fast mm -hmm. and be able to change your lighting and your exposure on the fly, and I'll never give up weddings just because I think they keep you sharp. 
So, and I do st still do some portraits, just regular portraits. Uh huh. People that know me here. Right. It, it's funny because you know, my first foray into professional photography was as an underwater photographer and videographer. And uh, during that time, I would be chasing people around underwater with a video camera, uh, <laughs> trying to you know, get them on video, f having a time of their life, you know, scuba diving in the Red Sea and seeing the fish and the sharks and all this kind of thing. And, uh, and so, you know, during that time, I had to really literally you know think fast and try not to die and and try <laughs> trying to photograph people and look and out this for kind the sharks yeah really uh, they were the le they were the least of the problems uh, but when I moved into wedding photography, I found that those skills of being able to literally you know turn on a dime and and you know capture everything that was going on was a real asset so i I certainly know what you uh, what you mean with that so yeah. Uh, so with, with boudoir photography particularly, what would you say was your biggest challenge when you started out in, in this arena? Posing people that are not models hard, that's just difficult, but you're working with a girl that's never posed before, so, you know, she, oh, it was hard. Yeah. It's posing, definitely posing. If you're going to study anything, study that. <laughs> Right. I, I know when I started out, and I, and I thought that this was just me, uh, but apparently, you know, this, this, this same problem affects a lot of people, is that, you know, we spend a lot of time studying posing and we look at, you know, other photographers' work and, and we try to, you know, look around for creative ways to pose people and, uh, and, you know, and of course, you know, a lot of photographers now are using things like Pinterest to create sort of uh, inspiration boards, if you like, where they, where they go and find all these nice poses that they like and they stick them on this board and they look at them and try and sort of internalize them. And then when we get out on the session, it's like somebody just, I don't know, just took our brains out and they, uh, you go blank and you can't remember any of it. I mean, no, you it, can't remember it and not every client is built the same way, so a little shorter girl cannot pose like a six foot tall model. Her arms and legs aren't as long. Um, <laughs> It's, I would say to, the best place to start is learn the classical posing rules that the studio photographers did. And once you know them, you can incorporate them into anything. And they really work. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, so, so, so what you're saying then is to learn the principles of posing rather than the actual poses themselves. Yes, because um, the one pose cannot work on every woman. And, but if you know the basics, mm -hmm. the tried and true Old time stuff is great. Right. Bend I, the joints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it's like it's a little bit, little bit like um, math. You know, it'd be, it'd be like saying to somebody, "Well, okay, um, you have trouble with addition, so go and memorize the, the, every single possible result of addition, like two plus two and two plus three and two plus four. And memorize all of those when they could just learn the principle of how to add two numbers together, and then they would know instinctively the answer to." All of right. those things. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I hadn't really thought about it, you know, like that. You know, is that, uh, getting the principles down, and it, as you as you mentioned just now, that the joints, you know, the hands, the wrists, the knees, the the neck, all all, all of those moving parts that we have um, have to be dealt with in in different ways according to the person's physique and the and the the way they're built and and just their uh, I guess also comes in with their personality as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it definitely does. Some of them are more conservative, and you can't have them do things that the wilder girls are willing to do. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, uh, and, and Michael had a great comment on that one. He said, there's a reason they are called classical poses. They work. <laughs> Very true, <laughs> Michael. Very true indeed. And, uh, and so, um, what, I mean, what, what, would you, what would you say was your favorite resource for learning about posing? I really liked Sue Bryce's creative live seminar. I just thought she was really amazing at it. And I just picked through different books and just read. I have a book here. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, here it is. It is by Jeff Smith. It's an Amherst Media book. It's just posing for portrait photographers, head-to-toe -to -toe guide. And he gives you a lot of, of good 
you know, how to avoid double chin and uh, the tilt of the head and shoulders mm -hmm. and arm placement. But uh, I, I reference this book quite often. It's kind of worn out. And then I really like the seminar that Sue Bryce gave. And, you know, so you pick little things up from different areas. Right. Just do a Google search on it and you'll come up with things. And, and you don't learn it all right away. It takes practice. And um, I, I know I'm getting better and better at it. So mm -hmm. It's just something you have to work at. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I would quite agree. You know, it's 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 like you know we we're, we're always learning new stuff. Uh, I mean, it's, it's never a case of well, I just learned all the posing stuff. I don't need to learn anymore because it, it evolves and changes, and there's always nuances and little little differences that we can do to really make these uh, these photographs. Uh, yeah, sing. you have to break it down. There's um, I know when I see a lot of photos posted on the Boudoir Photography Network. Um, Facebook group, the eyes will be cut so far from camera that you just see a lot of the whites of the eyes. I need to do a blog post on this. I see it so much. And it, it just doesn't look good. Um, there's all kinds of things like that. The, with lighting, the, you have to, this isn't really posing, but with lighting, you have to watch catch lights in the eyes because if they're at the bottom of the lies, it gives you a um, Halloween look. Mm -hmm. I, think you're, I think a client's expression is just as important as the pose. They have to have, you know, you can't have a bad face on an awesome shot, and it's just not going to work. Right, yeah. and, and and of course, and this question just literally just popped in, into my head, so it's not one I had sort of prepared in advance, but there's a certain psychology involved in this type of work, I'm sure, because you know these photographs are meant to be you know they're alluring and, and a little bit sexy and you know all that kind of thing and so uh, there are certain sort of psychological aspects to it especially when you mentioned the eyes just now in that you know it, it, the, the but darker eyes tend to have that more more of a sort of a sensual look to them so that, as you mentioned before, you know, taking the, the having too much white, showing too much white of the eyes takes takes that away. Is that is that kind of what you meant? Yeah, it's just. I uh, wish I had a photo to show. It, it when they're looking, when they're cutting their eyes very far to one side, it it just there's too much white and it's distracting. I don't know how to explain it other than that. But I'll have to do. A, I'll do a post on that. Oh, okay. So. Okay. Great. Um, and and so, what would you say are the biggest business mistakes that you see made by photographers trying to get into this genre? They try to get in. They try to go into business too soon before they know what they're doing. Um, they don't know how to pose, and they don't know lighting. They do too much Photoshop in a bad way. Um, and their website, a lot of bad websites. Even good photographers I see with really bad, bad websites. And that's the first thing a client's going to see when they, you know, when they are looking for you. And if it's a bad website, I used to be a big believer in music on websites. I had this, what I thought was an awesome little website and this cool music going with it. And now I've completely changed my mind about it. I don't think you should have music. Everybody's at work when they're looking at your website. <laughs> right. And they don't need the boss, come, some stripper music come on in the middle of the office <laughs> when they click on your site. So, yeah, no, I would you, you, do away you, with the music. Get away from the flash site. You know, narrow your work down to your very best images. And don't talk about your pets or <laughs> your kids or you have a headache in your blog post, just keep it business. Talk about <laughs> your images and your shoots and look at any expensive brand, um, anything, a car. You go to their website and you don't see them posting personal things on there. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to be high end, I don't know, I just think you need to keep it business. You can insert some of your personality but yeah, There's uh, you, too you, many you, moms you. with a camera out there that are, it's kind of like their personal website blog and their business website blog, mm -hmm. and they're mixing the two, and it doesn't work. See, so, now, of course, you know, the people that are listening to this who are regulars of these webinars and who follow my blog will be going, 
oh gosh, oh gosh, you know, she, she's, uh, she's just stuck his soapbox in front of him and inviting him to stand up on it now and start yelling from the rooftops about <laughs> websites and blogs because they, they oh, know. Is that your thing? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm very passionate about WordPress. I'm very passionate about websites, I, I, you know, I, and, and blogging. I, in fact, I, I taught a, uh, a, a class uh, the other weekend uh, to about 45 uh, photographers about uh, how to write a blog post and, and uh, you know all that WordPress stuff and you know one of, one of my and I'm not going to I don't want to you know distract from this webinar too much on this but uh, you know one of the one of the big things that, that really annoys me is seeing photography website templates that are built by companies who want to market their stuff to photographers but don't understand the photography business and they don't understand how photographers need to sell and so what they do they say well you know here mr photographer you know here's a here's a nice looking website template where you can have a whacking great slideshow that takes up the entire screen oh and by the way we're not going to give you any room where you can actually put any marketing copy in there because well you're a photographer and you probably don't think you want that and it just drives me nuts <laughs> because it destroys their SEO, that it destroys any possibility of making a connection with their pr prospective client and, uh, and it feeds into this really bad idea that photography will just sell itself. Right. So, oh, uh, that is not the case no. anymore. <laughs> no, it really isn't. <laughs> you uh, have to work it. <laughs> so I'm going to climb down. When, yeah, well, I used to think when my work was good that people were just going to come flooding in the door. Oh, no, they don't. You nope. have to then the whole business, you think learning to be a photographer is the hard part? Mm -mm. Learning that Photoshop and learning how to take a good picture is the easy part. The hard part <laughs> comes when you have to start that marketing and, oh my God, it's hard. <laughs> Blogging Twitter, Facebook, Google+. <laughs> I yeah. want to kill myself at the time. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, you know, it, it keeps you busy. And, that, and, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I put that class together the other week where I said, look, you know, it, I know, I know you're all struggling with your blogs. I know you're all having a hard time you, you, because you think you have to be a writer and you, you've got to write every day and you've got to do all this stuff. Well, that, none of that's true. You can actually create a really good, engaging photography blog in one hour a week or less. That's all you need to put into it if you have a system for doing it, and that's, that's what I taught in the, in the course. But anyway, uh, getting back to the, the subject at hand. And climbing I could go down. on and on about websites. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really need to get off my soapbox because the altitude is killing me up here. Um, <laughs> but um, Nigel's right. Listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I hear photographers saying about uh, getting into boudoir photography, and I've and I've and I've actually seen this uh, a couple of times just in the last few days. In fact, is that uh, they're expressing some conflict about getting into the genre because they worry about what their friends and their family might think about the type of work that they're doing. And, and you know, it's like one one lady I saw the other day. She she wrote, you know, well, this um, she's in in the south here where I am. And, uh, and of course, down here, you know, everyone's a little bit more conservative, I suppose. And this friend of hers said, well, what, so what do you do in, in this photography thing? What, are you, what types of things do you do? And she goes, well, um, you know, I photograph weddings and some portraits and, you know, oh, and, and boudoir. And it was, it was like, ooh, you know, really? You, you know, and, and it's, she was kind of worried about what people are going to think about her. So what, what, what advice would you give people who are sort of dealing with these kinds of cultural issues around boudoir photography? The only thing I know is if you live in that kind of an area, you're going to probably have to keep your images more on the sweet side and really not show a lot. Mm -hmm. that, I th and then if you do more risque things for your clients, that's fine, but I don't think I would put it on my website. I would right. have it cute I have a couple pictures of a girl in a slip and she's on the bed with her hands up on her laying on her belly and it's like it's nothing horrible about it, it and then I have some really risque things on my site but here in the northeast we can get away with it mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so but that's I would just uh, say yeah just keep stay on the sweet side of it and don't take it too far right and, and of course then you know if you portray that kind of kind of works I'm sure that they will the people who want to take things a little further you know when they come to see you will will naturally just ask you know if they show up with handcuffs you know <laughs> <it's okay. laughs> don't laugh they show up with handcuffs yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do I, uh, <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, I, I, I did expect this webinar to be um, fun and, and exciting and interesting. I just, I just hope we don't get too far into the handcuff type. I'm, I'm holding back. <laughs> I can tell you some stories. <laughs> oh my I can goodness. make your ratings go through the roof. <laughs> Oh god! <laughs> or have you kicked off the air? I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, the go-to webinar would probably, you know, throw me out. You know, we don't, we don't like these type of webinars. Thank you. Do more <laughs> interviews with Robin. <laughs> oh goodness! So, um, and of course, you know, boudoir photography mostly features uh, female subjects. It's usually, well, it, I, I suppose that this is my my perception of it, at least, because I'm not a boudoir photographer. So, but my my. My perception of it is that it, that you would get mostly uh, females coming to you for for this kind of experience, and, and I, I would imagine that it's a very personal experience for them. Now, as a guy, you know, if I decided that I wanted to get into boudoir photography, um, I, I might feel that something of a disadvantage, you know, because there's a certain there are certain connotations associated with you know guys taking photographs of girls with their, most of their clothes on and all that kind of thing, and and so I mean, do you think we are at a disadvantage you know as as, as men in this business you know for example gaining the trust of the clients? I'm going to be hated for saying this by all the guys out there, but yeah, I do think you're at a disadvantage and. The reason is a lot of soccer moms have body issues and they're very shy about getting undressed in front of guys. They know that I'm not really judging them. I'm a woman. I don't and that's I don't know. They and I ask every single client, would you have gone to a male photographer? And they all tell me no. So that's just kind of like my little independent survey, but then maybe I'm attracting the girls that wouldn't go to a guy. Um, if you are a guy, I'm not saying you can't do it. But I think you're going to have to build a really amazing portfolio, and you're just going to have to work harder at it, mm -hmm. at winning their trust and um, being the upfront business kind of person. And I mean, I can get away with a lot of things that a man could never get away with. Right. Just the things I say and the way I act during a shoot, you know. So you, I think you can do it, but I do think it's harder. Right, and, uh, and and Michael says, not that you can't overcome it with charm in capital letters. Now, of course, you know that that would definitely go a long way. I'm sure, Michael. Yeah. Um, but you know, maybe uh, maybe having you know maybe one or two female assistants who you know are yeah, always always going to be there with you, so that the you know the, the subject knows that you know there's nothing nothing's going to you know take place here, right. nothing, nothing untoward, as it were. You know, I, I don't even know that it's always that the women are afraid that something bad's going to happen or the guy's a perv. I think that they just are embarrassed to get undressed in front of a man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's not always that they think the guy is horrible or whatever. He might be perfectly fine. It's their comfort zone of being undressed in front of another man. And a mm -hmm. lot of them say that their husband would kill them if they did that. So... Yeah, there's some insecure husbands out there, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, and Laurie, uh, Laurie had a, a comment on that. She says, I agree, a lot of women feel more comfortable with women. Uh, even as a woman, I tell them to bring a friend to the session uh, with them. So, uh, you know, that, that's a really great uh, comment, Laurie. Thank you. And, and Michael says, one must create a safe environment offer to shoot naked as well as the client. I, Michael, I, I'm not so sure about that. I don't, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a strange, um, it, it may work, I don't know, but I, I wouldn't advise starting with that one. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, I, I mean, do you find challenges in displaying your work online? I mean, do you, do you have trouble getting people to give you permission to show the kind of things that you photograph on the website. I think we, uh, I think we may have lost uh, Robin. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Did you hear me? Oh, I, yeah, I think I hit. I think I hit the button on my headset, which ah, happens. Yeah, I, I, I do that all the time. No problem. Because it hangs in your lap, and I accidentally hit it. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Well, so did oh, you displaying images online. Yes, yeah. it's it's hard to get clients to let you to do that. Um, I try to take some images that um, 
don't show as much that maybe they'll let me show, but they don't want their 10-year-old kid accidentally stumbling on a site or their friends stumbling on a site and saying, hey, I saw your mom on the internet. So um, there's a lot of issues like that. They're worried about their family seeing them. So mm -hmm. it's difficult to get them to allow you to do it. So what I'll do is um, a lot of times I'll get the girls from my hair salon and, I, and they have no money and they're always willing to trade photo shoots and let me post them. So uh, I'll do things like that occasionally to mm -hmm. come up with things to post. But it's a constant fight to have enough to post on the blog. So right. don't think you're the only ones out there having a hard time getting clients to let you post their images. Yeah, And I, I deal with a really high-end clientele in D.C., and that's a very conservative town on the outside <laughs> behind closed doors and people are crazy but <laughs> you can't go around DC a lot of their husbands have high powered jobs and they can't have that out on the internet gotcha so. gotcha uh, and uh, I think I saw uh, I saw a post this morning uh, on one of the groups maybe in your group I, I, I can't remember where uh, a photographer was kind of in a panic because uh, she had she had gotten so carried away during the photography session that she forgot to ask for a model release uh, from the client and she'd had a verbal commitment from the lady to put her photographs online but then her husband uh, saw them and got rather mad and threatened to sue the photographer. Um, I mean, it, I guess that's, that's definitely a real possibility, yes. isn't it? Yes. Do not post images unless you have a written consent. Don't even try it because you can get in so much trouble it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. um, and I always get a little annoyed when photographers feel like they have the right to post the client's images. That woman is in her underwear and she has paid you good money to take her photos. You do not have a right to violate her privacy like that and put that online. Her family could see it. It could affect her work. It could affect her relationship with her husband. Her kids don't need to run across it. So you have to think about all those things. And you cannot get angry with her because she doesn't want her photos online. Mm -hmm. She's a paying client. She's paid you to do your job. So that just annoys me to death when people get mad about it. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I, I mean, is, is, it, is there any mileage to be had in uh, extending the model release and saying, look, you know, um, you know, you know, we'd love to have you sign a model release to, for us to display some of these photographs online, but we, we, would, we would also like your husband to sign it too, so that, he, so that we know that he's aware that this can happen, um, you know, that some of these images will go online too. I mean, is there, is there anything, do you have anything like that? Uh, no, I don't have anything like that. The way it usually works with me is I don't really bring it up at the session. After I'm done with the editing, I'll email her a couple pictures and say, hey, I would really like to blog these, but I wanted to see if it would be okay with you first. And then if she says, oh, yes, I don't mind, then I'll send her a release and get her to sign it. Um, so I just handle it that way. I just go into a shoot assuming that I'm not going to be able to blog it. Right. So... Right. It's an so, issue I deal with constantly. <laughs> right. And so, you know, as a, as, a, as a business owner, then, you, you know, you have this sort of conflict where you have a need to promote your business by using your blog to do so, but you have something of a constraint also that's preventing you from sharing, you know, the images. In I just figure I have to work harder and I need to do model shoots on my own time or do local girls that I never really use professional, professional models. These girls don't, they're cute, but they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, you're just going to have to work harder and do model shoots to, for your blog or find, you know, somebody that's willing to trade. But for my DC clients that are coming in and paying me really good money, I am not hassling them about blogging their photos. That's right. not going to happen. Yeah. Very <laughs> I think good. it would make me look bad. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think and unprofessional. I think you, you're right. Um, so, can can you give us a quick look inside your sales process? You know, from the time say somebody first comes across your website to getting them booked for a session. I mean, how how does it typically work? With me, my, my prices are very high for my boudoir work, and right away, if they can't afford me, they're just going to bow out, and I don't really 
spend a lot of time trying to convince them to spend $4,000 on boudoir images because they just don't have it. Um, for the girls that do have it, I like to get them on the phone and talk to them and have a connection. Don't just go through email. Pick up the telephone and call them um, and try to establish a rapport with them where they like you and they're laughing with you on the phone and we're talking about how fun it's going to be and um, how crazy the shoots get and then if they do have the money to afford me they usually book with me I don't have a problem with it they just I just have that type of personality where I get along with people and it's not I mean that's it but I would definitely get them on the phone don't just go through email you know okay. how it is with blog posts on, I mean on PMs online on Facebook and things uh -huh. people don't understand what you mean and you know you just can't make that good connection the way you can if you're actually talking to them right you know and, and, and I saw an example of something like this earlier today uh, where a photographer found uh, actually a really good WordPress plugin I mean it, it, the, the plugin itself is really cool it's an appointment uh, calendar where people can actually book uh, sessions with you, it's not just for photographers. It can be for hairdressers. It can be for coaches. It can be all for all kinds of things. But people can actually, uh, you know, use this calendar thing to book a, a slot with you on directly from your blog, and uh, they, you can even set it up so they they have to pay for the session. Uh, but you know, my my advice to them, you know, was you know, look, you know, you, you don't want to just slap that on the website or on the blog and abdicate the responsibility of sales to this form um, yeah. because it's you know it's a sure way to fail I mean it, it, it really is I mean you, you've got to get these people on the phone whether you're doing boudoir photography or weddings or portraits you know what, whatever type of work you're doing you know I, I, I don't believe in trying to go for the sale right away from a website with one of these you know you know, fill this form out to book this date and these are the dates I have open and all this kind of thing. I think that should come later on. The only um, thing I think that might work on is if you're doing those uh, the marathon sessions, mm -hmm. they're a little 30 minute, maybe right. that would be okay for that, but um, if, for gen in general I wouldn't use it. Um, and if you talk to someone and you don't hear back from them, they're you know, give them a call again, mm -hmm. touch base with them again, and just or, or email them again and just say, hey, I just wanted to see if you were still thinking about your shoot. And you'd be surprised how many of them will come back and, and they will end up booking with you. But if you had just let it go, you know, maybe they would have forgotten about it or, you know, moved on. So follow up with your phone calls and your yeah. emails. Absolutely, and um, you know, that, that, you know, pricing is another big issue, you know, for a lot of photographers. And you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned a number uh, just a few minutes ago there that may have, you know, perked up a few ears there. You mentioned four thousand dollars. Now, I don't know if that was, uh, you know, your general sort of starting price or, or what. And you know, and and you know, not all photographers want to share their pricing, you know, in an open, you know. Oh, I don't care, and, and, and that's fine, you know. But um, but if you would like to, you know, share a little bit about your pricing strategies, uh, I think that would that would certainly help a lot of people because you know I was kind of disappointed to find out that you you're not one of these you know Craigslist photographers. I'll you know I'll shoot everything for 150 bucks, give you a CD, and I'll come to your house and buy your lawn for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Telling you the truth, I've been. I tried going the low end, and I still I wasn't booking anybody. And then the ones I would get, they would nickel and dime you to death. So I've been everywhere from um, six hundred dollars. You know, that was where I was trying to stay, like thinking people could afford between six and seven hundred dollars, and it was a pain. And I was working my butt off, and you know, really not making any money. And then so I have to give a shout out to Krista Miola here. Um, I went up to New York and hang out, hung out with her for a couple of days in her apartment, and we were just kind of going over things. And she's like, "What's wrong?" And I'm just like, "I just, I'm not getting anywhere." And she said, "Well, let's." She pulled up my website, and she was the one that told me we need to get rid of this website, and we need to focus on your best work. And then um, she's like, "You're targeting the audience that every other boudoir photographer is targeting, the $600 range. She's like, who's going after the high-end market in your area? And there was no one. So she's like, okay, you're going to get your prices up and go out there. And I was like, you're insane. Nobody's going to pay me. It's, I think I started out at $3,200 for a boudoir shoot. And I just sat there. I thought, that phone is never going to ring. 
and within two weeks I had booked my first one. And mm -hmm. I almost, after I hung up the phone for that, I was like, you know, dancing around in my office. <laughs> and then, of course, immediately think, well, I'll never book another one. So, you know, um, but I just took my website to a higher level. I took my customer service to a higher level. And I targeted the higher level girls. And it's been building. I've had people call me and say, I picked you because you were the most expensive photographer. There are people out there with money. Mm -hmm. A hundred, what a thousand dollars might be a lot of money to you, but to some people, it's no more than a dollar. They just spend it. They they show up at my shoots with shoes that cost twelve hundred dollars, and you know twelve hundred dollars in lingerie, and it's just nothing to them. Mm -hmm. So that was my decided that was going to be my target market, and um, my lowest shoot that I have is eighteen hundred dollars, and that happens here at my studio because I have a home based studio. It's a thousand square foot. It used to be an in-law apartment. It's completely separate from my house. So I will do those shoots here. But I find myself, I kind of get mad if I could do a shoot for $700. I feel like I'm working my butt off for nothing. And, you know, and then you don't give good service because you just feel like you're not making what you should make. Because well, I know yeah. how expensive this business is to run. Like the equipment's outrageous. And then you know, there's always a marketing or new software. And, it never ends the money that's going out the door. Right. Plus, yeah. you know, if you have to, if you have to do, you know, five and six sessions a day or something crazy just to keep your head above water, you're going to get burned out. You're not going to feel creative. You know, when you when you're working at the level that you've consciously put yourself at. I, I, I imagine that you can approach all of these sessions with feeling refreshed and renewed and creative and energetic and ready to go. I'm doing one girl a day, and it's all about her. Right. Like I just babysit her from, you know, I'm calling her in the morning, hey, are you ready for your shoot today? And I'll see you in a couple hours. And then um, when it comes time to do their proofing, I go to them or we meet at a restaurant somewhere and sit in the back corner so nobody can see and I take my laptop and I buy them dinner and I buy them drinks and we do her proofing session right there and you know it's like girls night out it's not mm -hmm. like sit in my office and do a proofing session so it's it's fun I love this work yeah I have a great time with my clients I can tell you know I, you know, I can hear the the enthusiasm in your voice it's, it's great uh, I mean, but you know, then of course, there's going to be people who'll say, "Well, come on, Robin. I mean, you live in Washington D.C. You, you know, you, you've got all these uh, fancy schmancy people up there with oh, no. uh, money coming out of their ears." You know what? Uh, I what, live what? in a cornfield in <laughs> Southern Maryland with Amish buggies all around me. I do not live in Washington D.C. I drive my butt <laughs> an hour and forty-five minutes one way to get there. So, uh -huh. but, but yeah, even. But Every community, I think, has the niche of people with money. You just need to target them. I mean, I guess there are some places in the United States that don't. Um, in that case, I don't know what to say. <laughs> no, you're absolutely <laughs> right. You, you, you're but don't move to D.C. <laughs> you know, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, every community has people who are prepared to spend money. Uh, I think, you know... Photographers, you know, if they are targeting the wrong section of the market, or they they have this incorrect idea in their mind that that people are just not going to pay the high prices, so they don't try to charge the high prices, and they end up just attracting the lower end. It's almost like that that kind of validates their false hypothesis that well, no one out no one out there has money. Yeah, and let me let me tell you guys, I went through that that. Uh, thing of thinking that no one is going to pay this amount of money. It's insane. It's never going to happen. I f really wrestled with that for a long time. I just didn't, and even now sometimes I'll start, if business gets a little slow, not with my boudoir prices, but with my wedding prices and other things, because they're not really my specialty, so my price isn't as high as my boudoir prices are. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I'll think, ah, if I just lower my price, you know, maybe a few more people will come in. It doesn't work. It, it seems no. like you don't get more clients when you lower your price, I don't think. And if you do, then you just get the really bad ones you don't want in the first place. So I understand, you know, if you get your work up to a certain caliber and then you get a really good website, there's no reason that you can't just bite the bullet and try it yeah. and throw it out there and, 
you know, see what happens. That's basically what I did. I went on complete faith. When, when Krista told me that, I was like, okay, she's out here doing it. She knows what she's talking about. I'm just going to shut up and listen to her. And I mm -hmm. did, and it worked. So, And, was, uh, you know, I, you don't have to be the world's best photographer, you know, in your current state to do this. I, in, in the sense that, um, you know, you have, to, you have to be dedicated to your craft and willing to learn and, and improve and all that kind of thing. But what I'm kind of saying is that, you know, if, you, if you're technically competent at what you do and you, you yes. have a good way of working with the clients and you understand the business and you care about the, the people that you're working for there's no reason why you cannot charge at least you know significantly higher fees than maybe what you're charging right now um, as long as you're committed to continual improvement yes um, and, and you know I went to the extreme I went to the very high end but there are people out there charging less that do that are making it and are doing a good job and it's their marketing, it's their customer service and they have it set up so that they're shooting more than one person a day mm -hmm. and it works for them. So this, there are different ways of doing it. This was just the way that I found to go that worked for me was going high end. Um, I would probably go crazy if I had a ton of people coming through a studio during the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like slower, slower pace. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, low volume, higher return is is, is definitely the the better way for you know. I agree. I agree. I, it's maybe, for me. It is yeah. for me. But I know that there are some people out there that are doing well, and you know they're charging maybe a thousand dollars a shoot, but they're doing more people. Right. So yeah. you know, I'm I'm just so involved with my girls, and their shoot will go on until if they're difficult to pose, I I'll run over my time limit. I just put a time limit on the packages just to have one but I have I'll go over that without any problem at all until I get them in the poses that I want and it's not easy and you have to work with a lot of them they just don't get it or they they're uncomfortable so I couldn't do that if I was doing high volume I'd have to have them out the door in an hour for mm -hmm. the next person to come mm -hmm. in so right you know, but you can do it that way yeah you can yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, some people thrive on that higher volume stuff. So there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's just that you, if you're going to go that route, then you have to have the business model set up to support it. You know, that's um, yeah. And if you live in a conservative area, I wouldn't put all your eggs in one basket and only shoot boudoir. I would just do everything. Yeah. Do do the weddings, do the portraits. You know. Yeah. Keep your income flowing. And, pro and probably, you know, in that case, you might want to have a separate website for Definitely. boudoir stuff to keep it away from the uh, from the other things. Yeah, um, you don't want high school seniors logging on your site until they might like <laughs> it. The boys, but <laughs> right, right. Um, and uh, Tim had a, an interesting comment on the on the, the business model side of things. He said, the "One downside to high price, low volume." is that a drop in volume can have a higher effect on income as a percentage of the overall income. Um, and he prefers to work that way, but it is, you know, this is, it is something to think about. You know, if you, you, know, if you have, uh, let's say, an average of five sessions a week uh, you know, at, at a high income level, and then for, for one reason or another that drops to, you know, all of a sudden you're only doing three sessions a week, you know, that, that, that can have a significant impact. Yeah. I still also do weddings and portraits. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take whatever. I've even done some commercial work, so it's whatever. Whoever calls me for, it's a nice variety. I right, think. keeps right. you from getting bored. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I mean that's that's uh, that's something we definitely want to uh, avoid. Now the uh, that uh, that guest article that we had on the uh, on the Zenalog site this week from you talks about you know finding. Um, the best, you know, out of a location that you might be working in, and you use the example of that uh, sort of rundown location with a, you know, broken up house and uh, broken up car and all this trash and garbage everywhere. Um, and I really liked the the way that you were able to bring out some, uh, you know, bring out the real sort of uh, character of the people, but also make the location look really cool too. Um, and then uh, there was one of the comments on the blog post from someone that, that asked, well, what about when you're working in someone else's home? You know, how do you, how, how do you deal with the fact that, you know, you might show up at their home and, it, you know, it isn't ideal, that it's, there's maybe uh, some kind of challenges with regards to finding a decent background uh, to work in in there. How do you, how do you 
typically work around that kind of thing? Well, I don't work in their homes, but if I was in that situation, I would immediately try to declutter the background and move things out of the way. Um, you, you really need to know lighting well because you can't count on their house to have nice natural lighting, so you're going to have to know how to use your flash. Um, you're, you're just going to have to do a quick look around and pick the best place that you can find and work with it. There's, you know, every situation could be so different. Every single house is going to be different, so you don't know until you're there. Declutter the background, um, pick the area with the best light, and you're, you're going to have to shoot shallow probably to hide the background so you can mm -hmm. blur it out. Or you could uh, make it go dark and just use your lights to light your client. So there's things like that you can do. Okay. But I would think it would be very hard. <laughs> yeah. Not knowing what you're walking into. <laughs> Okay, well, we're just about at the end of part one of our uh, sort of interview uh, webinar here. Um, but I had just, I had just one more uh, question before we wrap up part one, and then if anyone else has any particular sort of specific business or marketing questions and that kind of thing, and you want to get those in before we move into part two, uh, we'll, we'll take some of those. Um, but I know that you have a, this thing that you call the Booty School, which I think is a great <laughs> sounding title. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And you know how um, how does that work? You know how can that help uh, boudoir photographers specifically? Well, I had the I have the Facebook group, and really good information was getting posted on there. And then you know, in the day, it would fall off the page and never to be found again. Um, so I wanted a place where when something really good came up, I could post it and it would stay there, and people could go and reference it later on. Mm -hmm. So I started the booty school, and it's brand new. I'm still adding content to it as I have time. Right now is my busy season, so I haven't had time to, to do a whole lot. But um, it's just random articles on lighting and posing and good software information or books that you should read. So as I come across things, I keep adding them to the Booty School, and it's a, one place that people will be able to go and learn all kinds of little things. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and and I know that you have uh, also taught some workshops and that kind of thing, you know, sort of lighting and posing workshops and and so on. Uh, do you have any plans for uh, for those coming up at all? Um, I might do one in Vegas because uh, I'm going to be out there anyway. But I was starting to do on the workshop route, but I've decided that I'm going to pull back from it because I can't do the websites and take care of my clients and do workshops too. I, need, I was getting too scattered. I, my focus was going in every different direction and I wasn't concentrating on what makes money. Workshops don't make money. Mm -hmm. They're um, high stress, uh, low return, and right now, I may do it more in the future, but right now I'm just pulling back from that. The market's flooded with people doing workshops. So I'm right. just going to pull back from that for a while. Okay. Like I said, Vegas, I'll be there anyway. I might do a few um, one-day workshops with five or six people because I'm going to have the hotel suite and everything already. So mm -hmm. Okay. That's all right, and a couple of questions come in. Uh, Laura says, how do we find the Booty School? Uh, so what's the, what's, the, what's the website address it, for that? It's www.the Booty, B-O-U-D-I-E, school.com. Cool. Okay. And if you go to my website, just robinowen.com, there's a link right there on the landing page. You can go right to it. Okay, easy. All right, awesome. And, and Ian asked, uh, what's the usual motivation for your clients? Are they buying uh, these images for themselves or for, for other people? Uh, they always say it's for their husband, but... <laughs> Once you start talking to them, it's for them. So most of my packages come with two albums. They come with a little black book for the guy, and then they come with a big fancy album for the woman. So, um, <laughs> right. And they just they just have had kids, and you know they've done the whole mom housewife thing, and now they want to bring it back and feel sexy again. So. Mm -hmm. They do give them as gifts. That's their excuse, I think. <laughs> yeah. 
but <laughs> it's all about them. <laughs> of course, absolutely, and uh, and so it should be too. I think. Uh, well, I had a girl that just got back from Afghanistan, and she's like, "I've been over there in the sand and the grit and the muck and no makeup, and you know, she's <laughs> like, I'm just ready for girl time." So. Wow. Know, get all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, well, that. That kind of brings us to the end of uh, of part uh, part one.